Sleep in video games can cover a lot of ground. It's a status effect, of course, but it can be so much more. It's a restoration tool and a hindrance. It can be a tiny speed bump or the worst thing to happen to your turn economy. It can be a dose of realism, or if you do it wrong, it can wreak havoc on the game's pacing. With so much range, it'd be a good idea to get a sense of all your options. Get comfy. I sleep. Wake up, Dan. You're late for your programming job. Well, what? But I don't even know how to program. Then hurry up and learn. At today's sponsor, Boot.dev. Boot.dev is your perfect intro on the path to become a professional programmer. They've made a full set of Python and Go programming language classes, put them all into a big gamified website, and take you by the hand to teach you how to code like a pro. These are bite-sized, self-guided lessons meant to help you get your feet wet as a back-end developer. If you've ever been curious about learning to code, but didn't know how to start, Boot.dev is going to be way more effective than trying to wing it yourself. They've designed it to make sure you're never bored, always giving you the next achievable goal. Stick with it, and you'll be shocked at how far you'll go. And it's way cheaper than going straight into university classes. Go on a journey of self-discovery through coding. That sounds nice. Boot.dev members also get access to their Discord, full of people learning right alongside you. When you get stuck, there's plenty of people to talk to to help you get unstuck. Boot.dev is even available for free in guest mode, so you really have nothing to lose. Pop over there by using the link in the description and sign up with my code DESIGNDOC to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. 25% off your first month or year, depending on what you choose. Go get yourself a new skill over at Boot.dev. Okay, let's start with some of the common basic sleep mechanics in games. So what can sleep do? One, sleep can cause you to sleep. Yep. All right, the first thing we're talking about is the part everyone has a sort of intuitive sense for, but how that gets translated into a game will have subtle variations. Everyone's familiar with sleep as a status effect. You wanted to do something? Too bad, sleepyhead. Wake up first. Different genres will have different approaches on what sleep means for their systems. In turn-based RPGs, sleep is often used as a long-term stun, a blocker that keeps you from taking your turn. How long it lasts depends on the game. Some let sleep expire automatically. Some keep you asleep until you do something, either getting rid of the status with a spell or item, or maybe just slapping someone awake. There's a bunch of overlap with stun and paralysis effects, with subtle trade-offs to make each status feel different. Sleep might last a little longer, but be more difficult to take hold than the game's paralysis effect. Sleep might guarantee that a turn gets skipped, while the other statuses just give a chance for that to happen. When a sleep effect does land, the time it takes to kick in can sometimes vary. In some games, it's instant, but not others. In Pokemon, the yawn move makes a Pokemon drowsy for a turn before they fall asleep the next. Other sleeping moves like Sleep Powder and Sing take effect faster, but are less accurate. Some moves synergize with sleep, like Dream Eater, which damages a sleeping target and heals you, or the Wake Up Slap, which is extra powerful if you're waking someone up with it. There's also specific counterplay to sleep. Chesto berries wake you up immediately, and insomnia keeps you from falling asleep at all. If you set it up beforehand, a move like rest can fully restore you, and a chesto berry automatically wakes you up, removing the drawback. It's like a free full restore. Pokemon has a lot of nuance built into its sleep mechanic, way beyond just skipping turns. In action games, using sleep on offense can be about timing. Sleep can take your opponent out of commission for a while and buy you a lot of time to set up a big combo or just one devastating blow. Any attack in Monster Hunter on a sleeping target does double damage. Build your character to inflict sleep more often and you can afford to do extremely slow moves. Set up your most cumbersome attack and do some big boy damage. It doesn't even have to be moves really. Surround the monster with explosive barrels. You've got the time. Heck, you can even use that sleep time to recover yourself. Sharpen your weapons, heal, take care of other issues. It's a great way to reset the fight if it's getting a little out of hand. The effect doesn't have to be a two-way street though. If a game isn't meant to be competitive PvP, it's very common for sleep to affect computer characters one way and player characters another. In Monster Hunter World, if you're about to fall asleep, you aren't knocked out immediately. You greatly slow down first and have a small window to cure the effect before it takes hold and leaves you vulnerable. There's a big difference in how sleep can feel in a game when you inflict it versus when it's inflicted on you. 
and there are plenty of pitfalls to watch out for, but we'll get into that more later. In the Kirby series, sleep isn't the status effect inflicted by enemy attacks, but it's one of the copy abilities you can get. Don't go out of your way for it though, it's one of the few abilities you actively should avoid. When you get it, you sleep. That's it. Nothing more. You wake up in a bit. It's an interesting obstacle in the game. Sort of a poison pill for Kirby's suck ability that might cause a problem if you're blindly grabbing any ability you see. For a kid-friendly game, it's a very clever way to mix in some very light negative consequences. There's another major category of sleep effects that games commonly use, refreshing and restoring your capabilities. Baldur's Gate 3 extensively uses mechanics from Dungeons & Dragons, which makes sleep almost a necessity. No matter how much you'd like to, you can't fight forever. When you're out adventuring in D&D or in Baldur's Gate, your resources are always draining. Your HP is going down, you're burning up spell slots to cast things, you're using abilities you have a limited amount of, your bag of tricks keeps getting lighter. To recharge, you have to take some time to rest. Baldur's Gate splits rest into a couple things, a short rest and a long rest. Short rests are meant to be brief pauses to gather yourself before venturing further into the dungeon. In universe, it's like stopping for an hour. You might get a little health back. Some classes get a few spell slots refreshed, but if you ran yourself ragged, you aren't going to be all the way back to full power. A long rest is, well, a longer rest. It's closer to falling asleep and waking up in the morning. Your health replenishes, all your spell slots refill, and you're basically good as new. The problem is, it's not usually convenient to stop and just take a nap in the middle of a scary forest, or a dark cave, or wherever you find yourself. Just because you want to take a break doesn't make the world stop for you. If you're asleep for 8 hours, anything can happen. There's an early example found in an encounter with an owlbear and her cub. You could fight the creature if you're up to it, but you can avoid the confrontation altogether. If you play your cards right, you can even get your own owlbear cub at camp. The fight with the mama is a limited time offer though. If you leave and go long rest, when you return, everyone's dead. Goblins, the owlbear, everyone. The cubs somewhere else. In this game, some opportunities will pass you by. Sleeping isn't without its own opportunities though. Long rest often triggers story events and camp life segments. You'll learn about party members and can make decisions that influence both your relationships and maybe even how they perform in combat later on. You never know what might happen next when you shut those eyes. There is another problem though. You'll need camp supplies to do a long rest. If you don't have enough on hand, you could opt for a partial rest instead, something in between short and long, get half of your spell slots, half your HP back, and be on your way. Though now you definitely don't have enough supplies to rest again. So be careful out there. The difficulty that you have in fully restoring your health creates a lot of the drama of a dungeon. Pressing on might risk losing everything, but stopping might be just as dangerous. Choosing between two bad options with real consequences for each one is a great way to raise the stakes and drama of a story and to make players plan ahead. So sleep can provide a bunch of mechanical stuff, but lots of other status effects can do that too. What's so useful about adding a sleep mechanic specifically? There's an intuitive quality to sleep that helps ground the in-game effect to something more relatable to the player. If you see Scarlet Rot as a status effect in Elden Ring, well, you could probably get the sense that it's something bad, but what exactly is bad about it could practically be anything. If sleep shows up in a game, you won't have to do quite so much tutorializing about what the effect might be. For games that try to bring a more realistic and grounded flavor to their setting, like simulations, survival games, or role-playing games, that can be a great asset. Citizen Sleeper is a narrative-driven RPG derived from a very tabletop-like gaming experience. You're an escape robot, hiding as a refugee of sorts in a space station that has seen better days. Really, everything in this game has seen better days. Through odd jobs and friendly connections, you build up a little bit of a life here as you pursue answers and try to carve out a future for yourself. But there's only so much you can do in a cycle, and so many more things that demand your attention. Each die at the top of the screen works kind of like a bundle of energy that you spend to perform a task you want to do. Each morning you roll your dice and spend them throughout the day on tasks, 
to track down leads, to work for money, or to help your friends in need. Higher numbers lead to a better chance of success, but win or lose, you've spent that dice for the day. Maybe tomorrow will bring better things. As the days go on, your body degrades. You get less good at regenerating your dice. A major mechanic is to get enough money to afford the medicine that keeps your deteriorating robot internals alive just a little bit longer. Sleep is used in this game to hit the reset button, but a little piece of yourself is lost every time you wake up again. Use your limited time wisely. It doesn't have to be all stark and serious though. A lack of sleep can be fun too, in a twisted sense. The Sims is the world's most accurate simulation of human life and models sleep in a realistic way. It's not really an option or a convenience. One way or another, your sim is going to have to turn in for the night. As the day goes on, your energy bar drains. You can hold off the decline a little with some coffee, but really you're supposed to nap in a chair or go to bed. If you try to power through anyway, you're fighting a losing battle. As you get more tired in the more recent games, your mood deteriorates. Your sim will try to veer off towards bed if you don't force them to stay awake. If they run out of energy entirely, they pass out and collapse wherever they're standing. Hope you're not swimming. Sleep is also a great way to give an in-universe reason for some quality of life features. Outer Wilds is one of the most honest schedule games I can think of. Things happen at specific points of time, and you might have to wait for those moments to come around before you can progress. You could wait in real time, or you could doze off. Shut your eyes, watch a timer take forward, and choose to wake up whenever you want. Outer Wilds updates its state without having to show you its progress until you're ready to rejoin the world. Sleep gives a more skeuomorphic way to time travel to the time frame you need. Sleep is often used as an alternative to combat. It takes a little more effort to fight your way through the game without destroying everything on the way, so the extra work usually comes with extra perks to make it worthwhile. Dave the Diver uses sleep as a way to loot better material. You're diving in this ocean to do story missions, but along the way you've got to catch the fish you're going to serve at Boncho's Sushi Bar. If you take the time to tranquilize the fish rather than stab or shoot them, your catch gets a 3 star rating instead of 1. You get more meat, which means more customers can be served, which means more revenue. Sometimes you get special drops that unlock better dishes. The game pays you back for making an effort to take the scenic route. If you want a more fun version of sleep, go study up on some stealth mechanics. Stealth games create fun by balancing action and inaction, risk and reward. How close can you get to these guys? Do you have the patience to wait a cycle, or are you going to push your luck? But some of these mechanics can start to feel out of the player's control. Waiting for the right cycle feels a little passive. One way that stealth games can add back some player agency is through sleep. Stealth and non-violence can go hand in hand. Dedicated stealth games often push you towards avoiding combat and violent action as much as possible, and sleep can be a tailor-made tool for that. Metal Gear Solid uses sleep all the time through tranquilizer darts. They let you non-lethally blaze your way through guards by taking them out yourself, rather than having to wait for their behavior to eventually line up with what you need. The mechanics of the tranquilizer have evolved over the years. In Metal Gear Solid 2, your silenced tranquilizer is one of your most powerful tools to get through areas with stealth as effective as a gun, but without raising nearly as much alarm in the process. Your dart's effect varies depending on where you land your shots. Headshots put guards out immediately, but a leg shot might need a few seconds before sleep can take hold. The sleep effect is temporary, and others can come by and wake up affected guards, so you aren't permanently removing a threat, but it should give you enough time to let you go where you need to. Sleep in this game is a weapon best used on unsuspecting guards though. If you're already being hunted, tranquilizing a guard or two can only do so much. In Metal Gear Solid 3 and 4, the game built in more rewards for getting through stealthily. Lethal weapons are more powerful in these games, so it takes even more skill to get through without violence. The new CQC system also gives a closer range stealth attack option. Taking enemies and bosses out without killing them can get you lots of special gear to use. Some encounters themselves even become much easier if you had taken a less violent path through the game. You can even trank wild animals like snakes, which you can capture to later eat, or throw at guards to scare them. Metal Gear Solid 5 lets enemies adapt to your tactics, including sleep. Are you putting everyone to bed with trank headshots? They might wear helmets now. 
use sleeping gas a lot, guards break out their gas masks. You can capture and recruit sleeping soldiers out in the field to then work for you at your home base, earning you money and research for more equipment and upgrades. Sleep in Metal Gear is a tool, built to open up different playstyles and give you tons of options to get through the game how you want to. So, sleep is a useful idea to mix into a game, but it's not without some problems. Games that use sleep have to work around some of its specific pitfalls. Lots of them involve how sleep is often an obligation. Kingdom Hearts Stream Drop Distance runs into a big pacing problem with how sleep shows up at inconvenient times. In 3D, you play as both Sora and Riku, each with effectively their own separate campaigns to complete. You will visit the same worlds, sometimes in different areas, progressing parallel storylines, and fighting their own respective boss fights. The two campaigns aren't identical, but there's some repetition in there. You still have to complete everything to actually finish the game. Now, you might assume that you'll just pick one campaign and do that until it ends, then start the other one. Not so. The game will make you swap between the two, not at any specific story beat or anything, but as part of the game's titular drop system. This meter drains over time, and once it hits zero, your character will immediately fall asleep on the spot and you'll swap to the other campaign. Doesn't matter what you're doing, you could be mid-fight on a boss and you'll still collapse. And the boss's health will reset when you eventually come back here. Fun. It's a bizarre choice. Swapping at non-specific intervals makes for jarring problems with the game's story pacing, and emphasizes some of the more repetitive parts of the game. You can mitigate the drop mechanic a few ways. You can extend the timer with consumables called Drop Me Knots. You could manually drop and swap characters yourself, which, if you realize it, you could just jump right back into your original character if you're forced out. There are some minor buffs you're missing out on if you do that, but that's not a deal breaker. The mechanic mostly serves as a nuisance, taking you out of the flow at unexpected intervals, and either forcing you to manually override it, or clutch through with the other character before jumping back to the story you were in the middle of. It's extremely disruptive, and even though it's prominent enough to be in the game's title, it's not a fun or helpful addition to the game. If you're not careful, an obligation to sleep in a game can feel like a chore, even more so if a game comes up with some weird punishments for not sleeping. The world of Brave Fencer Musashi runs on schedule, complete with a day-night cycle and even days of the week that NPCs, shops, and events all adhere to. Obviously, the schedule ties into character and story progression, but it also affects moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Brave Fencer Musashi makes use of a tiredness resource. As time ticks away, you get more tired. As it marches closer to 100%, it gradually affects Musashi more and more. Movement speed goes from running, to jogging, to walking, to slow walking. Attacks get slower, weaker, and shorter in range. You can still jump like normal, but almost everything else is impacted by how tired you are. It feels like your controls are degrading bit by bit as you become more tired. Turns out, that's kind of a problem for a platforming action RPG like this. Don't think you can just power through with bad controls though. Regardless of whether you're fighting or exploring, once you hit 100%, Musashi will unleash his ultimate attack. Sleep. He falls asleep on the spot and gradually restores tiredness and HP. Time speeds up too, so you don't have to wait as long as you might fear, but you're still out of commission for a good minute and you better hope that enemies aren't all up in your biz. You'll fall asleep no matter what you're doing, including mid-boss fight, so don't put it off too long. You eventually learn how to take naps, but until then, all you can do is chug healing stuff, stay at an inn, or wait for the sweet embrace of sleep to come over you. Side note, I like how there are actual vacancies in this hotel, like a real hotel. You almost never see that in games. Brave Fencer Musashi tried to inject a level of realism by making sleep a resource to manage throughout the game, but its execution gives it a little too much of a chance to annoy instead of just block. It can cause the game's pacing to drag, and its effects on movement are just barely enough of a problem to make the whole mechanic add up to a significant annoyance. Workable idea, maybe needs another refining pass. So if a sleep system can feel like a chore and a punishment, how do you fix that? You could try to flip around what sleep does. Instead of not sleeping being a punishment, make sleeping feel like a bonus. Final Fantasy XV doesn't have sleep as a status effect at all, 
It's got more than 30 of them, but none of them are sleep. Final Fantasy XV uses sleep as a mechanism for character progression. Every time you get XP, you don't get the benefits immediately. You have to wait until you check into one of the game's many hotels, or one of the campsites to get Ignis to cook something and then turn in. You only get your levels starting the next day. Not every accommodation is equal though. Better hotels give better XP bonus multipliers, up to tripling your experience if you visit a hotel suite fit for a prince. I mean, come on. Of course Fantasy Super Venice is gonna have a nice hotel. I mean, look at this place. I'd be three times better in the morning if I slept there too. Lots of other Final Fantasy games have hotels as an afterthought. A nice refresh, but completely unnecessary to stop in. Unless the story forces you. In Final Fantasy XV, the styling of sleep in this manner contributes to the road trip vibe, punctuating bits of grinding with rest, and giving more of a reason to flip frequently between the wilderness and back in town. So that's sleep. Before you go to bed, go to the comments. We're talking about even weirder sleep mechanics that didn't make it into this episode. Sleep is super adaptable when it's put into a game, but it can come with a lot of baggage. It's intuitive to players, but it can be a limitation. It can be a thing to avoid, or a thing that changes the way you play the game completely. As long as you watch out for the downsides, a little sleep might just be what your game needs.